Good morning. My name is John Patrick Picard. I'm an architect here in Maslin and a graduate of Kent State University. Um, I was going to tell you where I grew up, but I'm going to hold that now because I have an audience and you need to figure that out. It will come out pretty quickly for you all, I think. So um, I teach at Kent State Universal, University occasionally, and one of my students actually guessed the name of the town I grew up in. So it must be pretty apparent eventually. So, but I've been away from New England for about 35 years, so um, it's gone. Today we're going to talk about the meaning of architecture and we're going to start with a few definitions. Architecture is the development, design and construction of space or an element uh, or an environment that invokes an emotion. Very important. Architecture has to invoke an emotion. So these are just some of the slides um, I like to show because it, it, it's a space or an element that makes you feel a certain way. Places or images like this are cold and dismal perhaps, sad perhaps, massive or gigantic, dwarfing you, or very small, um, homey, comfortable. Kind of cold. In the house I grew up, we had a basement like this and there were six kids in my family and none of us wanted to go to the basement because it looked just like that. Or very cozy, a space like this. These are examples of how architecture created an emotion or invoke an emotion. So again, because it's so important, architecture is the development, design, and construction of a space or an environment that invokes an emotion. Architecture is also described as a sculpture that we live and work in. And architecture is the science and art of building. So we begin the creation of architecture with the need or a function a need or a function, such as shelter or a place to work, play, or worship. And the answer to the need and function invokes, um, evolves into the aesthetic art sculpture or sculpture that is architecture. So need plus structure plus materials plus aesthetic equals architecture. The study of architecture includes all buildings, not only the greatest and the famous, but also the ordinary. We all know the Taj Mahal, but this is also architecture in my mind. Architecture is the balance of science and aesthetic expression for the satisfaction of a need. The test or the three requirements of quality architecture are does the architecture work by supporting and reinforcing its function and its need? Again, we're trying to solve an equation. Is it built well enough to stand and be tested? Will its materials weather well and last? Does the architecture appeal to the visual and emotional senses? The foundation of all architecture design starts with the classical or Greek orders. There are three primary Greek orders, the Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, and then two other orders that are kind of derivations of them. The Doric is the male of the three orders. It is the male because it's stout, it tends to be very strong, it tends to be a little heavier than most columns. You see that on one of the Greek temples. The Ionic is the female. It's taller and slender and a lot more elegant. Some say the Ionic is much smarter than the door. I don't know. And then those of you who know me, my favorite has always been the Corinthian for a lot of different reasons that you'll find out about today. The Corinthian is the celebration. It's the most decorative and it stands alone. It marks the place of importance. The first Corinthian column was in the temple of Apollo and it marked his birthplace. Uh, Apollo was a god of a lot of Greek mythology, but of fire and war were mostly in sun. In my world, this is incorrect architecture because the Corinthians should always stand alone. So I'm not sure what happened here, but we'll let it go this time. The common elements of the columns are the base shaft and capital. This is the theme of all quality architecture. Every building should always have a base. It should always have a vertical element, which is a shaft, and then it should always have a capital. A really good example is the building directly across the street. Um, and it quite honestly looks a little bit like that. So you see the base of the building, the shaft of the building, and the capital. In the 20s, architects celebrated this very strongly. We were all into it, but today we're Less, less likely to show off that base shaft and capital quickly 
but it is very important in all architecture, and it should be. And I, I would say that if you do not see base, shaft, and capital clearly in architecture, the quality of the architecture may not be there. It's a very important element. Okay. Architecture also relies on rhythm, texture, light, color, and ornament to bridge the gap between need and function and beauty. So by rhythm, what I mean is the architecture has a pattern or a rhythm to it. You can see these. Again, more Corinthian columns, clearly misused and the rhythm of those gable ends of those houses. And then texture, which is a lot of fun. Texture and light go very well together um, and celebrate each other very well. And then light, probably our most important, uh, changes color. Light changes color on everything it hits. And color. And then finally, ornament. And these, these are applied features, and most of our architecture today has applied ornament. All of these tools we use in the practice of architecture, rhythm, texture, light, color, and ornament, are all amplified by proportion and scale. And proportions to us as architects is a system of knowing how large an element should be. How large should a window be? How large should the base of that building be? We apply it all to the human form. So we have a lot of different proportioning systems that we use to, to determine those sizes. And then scale talks about the differences of a space. And this little graphic shows on one end you know, an intimate space where the ceiling is very low to a space that is maybe like the IX Center in Cleveland where it's such a large space that it's kind of shocking, it's a little uncomfortable to you, and everything in between. That's, that's scale for us and how we use it to manipulate and invoke an emotion uh, to our users. And items like this where they're deliberately brought out of scale to be very, very large. Architecture also relies on the architectural building blocks, such as the arch, the arcade, barrel vaults, the dome, and trusses. Just like our columns, each one of these is in every piece of architecture. We cannot build architecture without these elements, the arch, the arcade, barrel vault. So an arch, this is a farmer with way too much time on his hands. Um, he did a great job because he's got the keystone in there and I would not want to be near this, but that is an arch, and that's a true arch with a keystone. And then an arch above a window, and again an arch. All the elements, and then an arcade is just a series of arches put together. Again, these are the tools or building blocks of architecture. And a barrel vault. Barrel vault is nothing more than an arch with depth. And then the dome. And a dome is an arch that has been spun around. And then I think last is the truss. Truss is nothing more than a beam that we overuse today. Um, it is a fantastic structural element that can carry the weight of a lot of different things, so it's a very useful tool. And those are the building blocks of architecture. The, ar the environment, um, environmental conditions of our world also help shape architecture. Environmental conditions such as wind, um, sun, wind, rain, snow, heat, and cold. All of these things we have to apply um, into our architecture. And for me, the use of light and how we deal with rain um, and snow also adds to the emotion that we create with our buildings. So sun is obviously an important one. These poor souls are out in this rain. Uh, snow, um, wonderful. Also my nemesis because it's heavy. And the sun, I'd like to slow down on this slide for a minute because the sun is the most underutilized architectural element we have in our environment. Uh, for some reason, um, we don't, as architects, we don't always pick up on the sun and realize this is such an important architectural feature. 
Um, the one thing that I tell my students, and most of them unfortunately don't know this, and I think they should, is that the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. You'd be surprised, I mean, you don't know that. And in the winter, the sun is very low on the horizon and very high in the summer. So to bring a lot of light into your house, into your office building, whatever it is, you put all your windows facing the south and southeast and you bring all that morning sun in, especially in the winter. In the summer months when we gotta try to cool all these buildings, you protect the building from that high sun. Um, but in Northeast Ohio, there aren't that many days when we don't want to bring all this sun into our environment. So um, we need to spend our time and um, look at utilizing the sun more in the practice of architecture. And then the last kind of tool or element in architecture is space. And this is, this is a little bit abstract, but it's a concept that built environments make you feel different ways. As an example, this figure on the, on the left is um, out amongst trees and it has a certain feeling. And then, but if you're in kind of an area well, not such a great feeling. And maybe some better examples are these where you're in a room and the window is very high in the room and that makes you feel a certain way, or the window is lower than the eye, and then every step in between, the fellow there in the middle seems happiest because he's got a whole wall of glass. So that's architecture and that's architects playing with architecture to invoke an emotion, which is the definition that we're trying to get to. This all brings us to the most important element and what we're here to talk about today is meaning. Meaning in architecture is a simple concept that a building or the built environment represents and stands for something beyond its function. Or that the structure that is architecture has deeper meaning, not simply a structure that solves the functional needs. There must be a story behind the architecture for it to have meaning. That is the most important element. This meaning or theme of architecture can be subtle or overstated and repeated often, and I'll share some images of that with you, um, in order to celebrate and communicate the meaning. Often in architecture, the meaning is hidden and that kind of discourages me. I think as architects, we should celebrate the meaning of a building so that it's clear to everybody using the building. Sometimes it's not. Um, so hopefully, we can try to do that. So meaning, meaning in architecture is true timeless architecture. We use the words timeless architecture when we think about materials. If a building has meaning and it has a presence about it, the meaning is clear, the building can last forever. Um, it will never go out of style, so it is always timeless. So meaning equals timeless. So now we're gonna take a look at some architecture. This is the Vietnam Memorial in Washington, a fantastic sculpture. It has a great deal of meaning, and the architect played with reflection, texture, color, smooth granite, and scale. A very unique feature of this wall is that when you stand in front of it, you see your reflection. And when you touch it to touch the name of a family member, there's texture and smooth. So this is very active, and it is nothing more than a, a stone wall, if you will. Meaning in architecture. And it's not a building, so all architecture is not the built environment to live in and heat and cool. Everybody's familiar with the Guggenheim Museum? in New York City, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. The Guggenheim Museum, again, uses color, texture, scale, which is very form. It is an example of form follows function. The function of the building was determined and the form came out. So it tells the story of what's happening inside before you ever get inside there. And then the TWA terminal, again in New York, um, is a bird taking flight. This is actually an example, it's ironic that it's a bird, is an example of duck architecture. Architecture that is so strongly a theme, it's, it got noted as duck architecture, and I'll show you why here in a minute. But this building was designed to look like a bird about to take flight. It's a TWA terminal um, and a fantastic. Aero Saarinen was the architect. This is one of my projects. Unfortunately, it hasn't been built yet. Someday soon, I hope. 
This is the Brewster Cheese Store. Brewster Cheese used to have an ice cream store and a place to buy a little chunk of cheese. And when we built their new corporate office, we tore it down. And they promised me they'd build a new one. So this building is our, our concept for that because it is on a tourist track and it's very important. So it's pretty clear what you can get here, I would think. Um, and that was the fun of it. And the, the reality here and the story behind the architecture is that you could sell cheese. Well, if anybody was in their old cheese store, it was one step above a barn, I think, to be nice about it. Um, it wasn't very nice and it wasn't very decorated. This is definitely a tourist spot and that's what we're hoping comes of it sometime in the future. So here's duck architecture. So what is this building used for? It was designed by an architect and it was used to sell eggs, duck eggs. So this is where the term duck architecture comes from. Now every time we build a building that follows a theme so tightly that you see it, this clearly, which is good architecture, you know the meaning behind this. Um, you may not know they sell duck eggs inside that, but you know it has something to do with a duck. So pretty important. Falling Water, Pennsylvania, fantastic piece of architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright, I tell my students that Frank Lloyd Wright was clearly an alien from a different world because no architect should have the talent that that man had. There's nothing he touched that wasn't beautiful when he was finished. But Falling Water was designed to fit into the environment. It's clear that it is an, ex an extension of the waterfall. Um, and if you visited, uh, have visited Falling Water, it was so important that it became part of the waterfall that there in the living room there's a set of stairs under a glass set of doors. You can go down and it goes right into the water. So you can go down and sit in the water and take off your shoes. If you haven't been to Falling Water, it's a must see, um, especially in the spring when mountain laurel is in bloom. Um, it's an amazing place. Uh, the Longer Burger Basket Factory, or back, it's actually their office, um, just recently sold to Steve Kuhn, which is really nice, because Steve is gonna uh, renovate the building. It needs some help right now. But it's an office building, and clearly it's an office building for a company that builds baskets. Um, there is a lot of good meaning here. Um, it is duck architecture, and it truly is, you know, there's no question what goes on in this building. And if there is, it probably shouldn't be going on in that building, so. Um, but if you haven't, this is in, I, I think, Newark, Ohio. A great piece of architecture and, and becoming very famous, and it is going to be saved, which is really nice. I think we have one of these in every community. Uh, this is duck architecture. Uh, there is the meaning behind the architecture. It's very clear uh, what this is and what, what the architect was trying to achieve. This is the Marines raising the flag at Iwo Jima in 1945, February 23, 23rd. And I have a lot of Marines in my family and a big fan of the Marine Corps. I actually wanted to go into the Marine Corps and I said, what is it that I could do for the Marine Corps? And they said, well, you could blow up bridges for us. I said, probably not gonna go into the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, I could build bridges better than blow them up. But this photograph, um, and this is one of my favorite pieces of architecture. I visited this museum several times, the Marine Corps Museum in Virginia. This is the sculpture. This is the building. The architect designed the building around that one photograph for the meaning behind that photograph. The tower is the flag and each one of the ribs, if you will, are the, the Marines erecting the flag. If you haven't been to the Marine Corps Museum, it is absolutely something to go visit. It is a wonderful trip and a phenomenal piece of architecture built around meaning and architecture. This is St. Peter's Church. I did not design it. I'm not that old. But I'm very proud of this church. My office used to be directly across the street, right from where this photograph is, and I was there in my window and I saw the first piece of St. Peter's Church fall to the ground. Fortunately, it was right after the kids got back out of, the third and fourth graders were across the street and they pass every day, and right after they did, that first piece of stone came down. By midnight, the day this happened, this was 15 years ago now, um, that whole face of the church was starting to collapse. Uh, it's my church, and Monsignor Finnegan was the uh, priest at the time and a dear friend. Um, so I got to learn about the church, things I never knew, and I had two years in rebuilding this church. 
So the meaning is more mine, quite honestly. It's emotion, and it's emotional attachment to the building. Um, but I gotta be honest, I spent $2 million. They gave me $2 million to fix everything, which is nice. And I had the most fun in practicing architecture with this building. They actually, up in the trusses of this building, they created these cable runs for me. And I would put on a harness, and I was like Batman. And I could go anywhere up in there and inspect things. So it was just a blast. So what happened with St. Peter's, and I'm just sharing this, this is a little off topic. Um, St. Peter's was actually a brick church, a red brick church. And when they built St. Peter's, they fired the brick on the site. Okay? So the brick wasn't very hard, unfortunately. It wasn't, our brick today is 10 times harder than it was in this. So the day the first piece came down, I climbed that tower. And it was very, very scary. It was a little wooden set of stairs that went up in a square about 18 inches wide. Half of the steps were gone. It was pretty bad. The brick at the top of the tower was about the consistency of talcum powder. You could reach your hand into the wall and it would be all over you. You could just, it was an amazing thing. So in the 40s, when this happened, when they realized something's going wrong with our church, it's falling apart, they tarped the entire church. They brought in uh, craftsmen from Germany and they parged, it's called parge, they put the cement coating over the entire church and then they carved in rocks, okay? And everybody thought it was a stone church. They unveiled it, they said, oh, they put stone on it. They did not put stone on it, they just put this, if you will, candy coating on the church. Such an amazing project. When we went to rebuild it, we had to tear it down. St. Peter is kind of in the middle there, just below that circle, and you can see, Saint, unfortunately, St. Peter lost his head when the church collapsed, but it was on the ground and it was fine. So we were able to put his head back on. But you can see how far we had to deconstruct the church when we got down to this point, you could actually reach into the wall, which is about four feet thick, and the brick was like mud. So the guys were picking it up and they'd make balls out of it and it would harden. They'd leave them out to harden and they kind of turn back into bricks pretty soft. So a major, major project. And that's us rebuilding it. And that's what St. Peter's looks like today. The fun part of this project is we had to recreate the stone look somehow and no one was there the the entire church was tarped so nobody knew how the masons from germany did what they did um, so we went to a place in texas to try to find somebody who could do this so sculptors and we actually made the rest of the tower we had blocks made opposed to a, a coating in the same shape and they sent up a load of them you know maybe 500 of these and they looked terrible and it's like, this isn't gonna work. Sent up some more, they still look terrible. They just couldn't get them to look. They made rubber molds and everything. They could not get them to look right. So they flew me to, te uh, yeah, to Texas to meet with the sculptors and they were working with all these hand tools, like somebody working with pottery and seemed perfectly logical to me that this is what you would build it out of. But we couldn't get the shape and um, and it dawned on me that it, it was like somebody took a scoop, like a big spoon, and went into the concrete and took a chunk out, okay? And it reminded me, I'm, I'm, I'm Italian, I've got a French name that my mom made a mistake and married a French person, but, but I am Italian. My grandmother always had these very large wooden spoons. So I went out to a store and I bought very large wooden spoons and that's how we created the box, the blocks. You took a spoon and you had this pile of concrete and you just scooped it out and it was like perfect. And then we just started making blocks and three or 4,000 blocks later, we put it all back together. So, um, Unfortunately, in, um, for the future of St. Peter's, it's, the church is still rotting from the inside. Gravity keeps it together. This parge coat is extremely strong. We had to take sledgehammers to get it off, to take it off. So when the, the masons from Germany put it on, they knew exactly what they were doing. They were creating something more structural. But just a phenomenal project and a beautiful church if you ever have an opportunity to see St. Peter's. This is polymer packaging down on Navarre Road. This is one of our projects we did 
probably 10, 15 years ago. Polymer Packaging is a very unique company. Larry Liam owns the company, and he invented a process using plastics. And he runs these plastics about 80 feet in the air, and then he drops them with heat, and they hit these rollers, and they go through all these rollers, and by the time they get to the ground, it's a bag, a plastic bag. I have no idea how it works. But it does, it follows this roller thing. So, Larry asked me to design his corporate headquarters. I had to learn about what he did because I wanted the building to have meaning. That's where the shape of this building came up. It's the plastic, the shiny plastic rolling over these rollers. So there's the meaning of the architecture. The funny story behind the story is I presented this design to Larry and I, from a plan view first, and he goes, how did you know? I go, how did I know what? He goes, how, do you know, how did you know I play a piano? I said, I didn't. <laughs> the plan of this building looks like a grand piano. So that's what he got. So I, I took it and ran. I told him the real reason for its shape, but he was happy on both sides that we, we represented what he does for a living and the inventions he's created and his piano. Beautiful building to still today. It, it has held up very well. And uh, fortunately, their company is doing very well. They slowed down for a while, but now they're, they're doing very well. And very fun project. This is E-Tank. It is out on Route 30, not very far from here. Alan Jaslow is the owner of E-Tank, and Alan is absolutely an art lover. On, he loves everything about art. However, he's very financially savvy, and this, he's tight with a dollar. That's the bottom line. So he came to me and said, John, I want a new office building. I want something bigger and something nice. But we need to keep it simple. It needs to be a, a box or something. We can't do anything too fancy. So I said, okay, Alan, we can, we can do this, but this is your corporate headquarters. We maybe need to think beyond this. And don't misunderstand, Alan was behind me the whole time. When he describes his building, it's what happens when you let an architect do whatever they want to do. So, and he did just that for me. So I took a square and I split the square on its axis and shifted it, did that. And then that wasn't good enough for me, so now I had to take the two triangles and I had to tilt them one end up. So that's kind of the form study that we created. So now I have a triangle in two different directions at the same time. So that's the aerial view of the building today. Slide it back together, it's a nice square, and that's what Alan wanted, give me a square. So, but we took it and we twisted it. Triangle played a part of the entire building. Every, everywhere it's in the floor, in the walls, every part of the building uses those angular pieces. And this building, by the way, it's always sunny at E-Tank. So if, you know, middle of the winter, go to E-Tank, it'll be sunny just like this. It really is, it's an amazing building. That it, it is the color, the color of the walls and the floors, but any natural light just floods this building beautifully. Alan sends me pictures probably once a month. He'll be in a conference room and the sun's coming through. And he's there with important people and he's taking pictures he's, and sending them to me. John, look at this view. And he loves his building, which is the most important thing for me. That's what the building looks like on the outside. So I'm a huge fan of Corinthian columns, but not everybody likes Corinthian columns. And as you know now, a Corinthian column marks a place of importance. So what's more important than the, the bow of Alan's ship, if you will? So this is looking right out on Route 30. So we needed to create a Corinthian column. Well, this is a very contemporary, modern building. And I didn't think that Corinthian column would quite work the same. So we created our own. And it had a fun story. There's, there's a young, young man in my office, which is a very talented architect. And so I did a sketch of what I thought the column should look like. And he did a sketch. His name was Devin. Devin did a sketch. And we, we sketch on trace paper. You can kind of see through it. And we took the two sketches just by accident, one of those aha things, and we just laid them on top of each other, and that's what we came up with. So it's a very fun column. You can see it. It's upside down in that picture. That's it being constructed, and it came out beautiful. And it's just a, it's just a feature that marks the important space, the front of the building, uh, draws attention. So meaning in architecture is everything, and this is one of the best examples they're all good examples, but this one is, really touches me. This is a fellow named Bone Cutter. He lives down in Columbus, and he's a relatively wealthy man. Well, when he started in life, he had nothing. And him and his wife, they owned this little piece of land out in the woods, and they built a pond with an island on it. And on well, the day they got married, they planted a willow tree, okay? 
So now, 25 years later, they had kids, and they're very successful. He's very well. He's done very well for himself. And he says, I want to give my wife an anniversary present. I want to give her a greenhouse. Okay, a greenhouse. I was thinking, you know, grow tomatoes in. <laughs> Not that kind of greenhouse, obviously. So this is the greenhouse we created for him. Everything about it, all the views, face the willow tree. So we created a movie for her showing what she was going to get. Obviously, she lives here, so she's going to see it, so we created a movie. So this is the willow, and basically it was a room for her to celebrate their marriage and this willow tree that is out in the pond, which you get a, a straight view of. Which, But this is what it looks like. It has this fountain, which is made out of copper, and it is a willow tree. I don't have a picture of it now, but we put a railing on that front that you saw that is a willow tree. That front porch looks right at the willow tree. And it, it truly is a greenhouse. She does a lot of planting, very elegant chandeliers, a beautiful ceiling. So this was her anniversary present at $190,000. So I, I got beat up by my, my wife for a lot of months while we're doing this. Um, but a beautiful thing and all about the meaning and the architecture. That's what this was all about, to give her something very special that brought her back to that willow tree. Rocky is his name, Rocky Bonecutter. Very successful young man, very, very smart. He is a huge fan of Austin Powers. Over the top, maybe. He asked me to create an office for him in a new office building, and that's what we did. And it's actually been photographed, and it's won an award already. A again, ridiculously expensive architecture, but the meaning to him is wonderful. He absolutely loves it, and it's so important to him, so very fun. Came right out of the 70s, 60s, a little bit of both. Controversy in architecture. I love it. I shouldn't love it so much, but I do. Canton City Hall. This project has the most history. This is, again, one of those meaning behind things, but this has all of it wrapped up to it. This is the City Hall. This is a sketch we did of the Canton City Hall, and the mayor was on the eighth floor, I think is that, and my office was down on the fourth floor of the Bank One Tower. He could see me and I could see him. It was pretty far away, but I knew it was him. And he called me one night. He saw me working in the office, and he said, John, I need a roof on City Hall. This thing leaks like a sieve, all the water goes in. There's kind of like a atrium in the center, but it was open air. Went, water went right through, right into the police department. It was a nightmare for them. And it had been that way for 50 years. So I did this sketch. And it, he wasn't going to pay me. I just said, well, I'll just sketch. I'm bored. I want to do something different. So I kind of came up with this Dr. Seuss thing. So I think he just put it on his shelf. Ten years later, ten years, he called and said, okay, we're going to build this. So I, I was shocked. So this is a rendering of the final look of it. Still had the big arching roofs at Dr. Seuss. The inside of it is very fun. I exposed all these curved roofs that we put on there. But this is the most important element. Everybody knows what that is, right? Corinthian column. The biggest problem with City Hall is nobody could find the entry doors. It looked like a fortress. It was a great piece of modern architecture but it was not very welcoming. You wouldn't think of it as a city hall. So we decided that we were going to get a Corinthian column to mark an important place, which is the entry to city hall. Um, it had to be big, so it's 25 feet tall, four and a half feet in diameter, and it does just that. It's made out of concrete. The problem is there was just a lot of controversy over it. Nobody thought the column was a good idea. And there was a group that tried to stop it, and fortunately the city felt strongly about it and the design, and they kind of backed me up, and we were able to persevere and get this done. Came out very nice, works very well. Uh, the best part of it is I love the practice of architecture, and I love teaching about architecture, and I, I venture to guess that you may not have known before today that a Corinthian column marks a place of importance. Well, the city did me a great honor, and they let me put a plaque up right behind that column that tells the story of the Temple of Apollo and where the first Corinthian, and why it stands there all by itself. So kind of a great thing, a lot of meaning to me, um, and it works. Um, it, it is a great building. It works very well. They've got, we were able to add a lot of square footage and give them offices they need. We used all the same material, all kinds of stainless steel and stuff, so it will last, last a very, very long time. This is Duncan Plaza, right behind us. 
Two years in design, a little bit of controversy here too. I was taking away a plaza that was also 50 years old, probably at the end of its life, and we needed to create a place that people could enjoy live events, a place where you didn't need to set up tables if you didn't want to, and we needed to get the concerts off of Lincoln Way because we're having our concerts on Lincoln Way. It's a loud place, not very acoustically proper. So there used to be a river that ran through this parking lot or this plaza historically when there was a mill before there was a city hall. And that's the theme we went with, trying to bring it back to nature, adding some curbs, adding different levels. So the trees are six months old, right? Thereabouts, not very. So I ask everybody, give me three years and this place is gonna look very different with the trees as they mature. What we try to do is capture the most views of the stage. The problem with the old plaza is the stage actually faced north, so the performer was facing north instead of the performer facing south. When that happens, the audience is facing south into the sun, so you can't see the performer. So we had to flip it all over, and I think that was the biggest hurdle we had. When we presented that, it was like, oh, no, you can't do that. Fortunately, we were able to do it, and it does work as a great uh, performance space. We can seat, you know, we were actually going for about 1,500. At the first concert, we had about 3,000. Everybody was comfortable. All the walls you see were designed as seat walls. They were designed for sitting on. That took a little while, too, to get everybody to sit on the walls. They weren't quite used to it. Um, and then inside the planters, we created these walks, accessible routes, with picnic tables up there. So there's just a lot of different seating opportunities. I, I think a very successful project, and I'm very proud of it, so I share it for that reason. This is the first North building. This is Robert or Bob Gessner's I want to say it's his dream, and I think it's a very important piece of architecture for different reasons that maybe not everybody knows about. First of all, Bob's brother, Rich, I should have to think about his first name, is an architect. He's an architect in Washington, D.C. Bob's theme for this project is he wanted it to be an example of a piece of architecture from the Industrial Revolution. Early 1900s, we were building factories, we didn't have good lighting systems, so we put in big expanses of glass to light the factories. Bob wanted to represent that. He wanted that piece of history back from Maslin. That's what the building was designed around. So Rich and I got together and we created this form that, quite honestly, we've had actual people come to it thinking that the building is 90 years old. Wow, it's in really good shape for its age. It's not that old, it's only about six years old now. So that's where the design came from. And then they're not here, but you can kind of see the, the brackets up at the top. Bob had sculptures made, seven in total, that tell the history of the city of Maslin from the beginning to future. That's the last slide. So if you get an opportunity to see this building, the last sculpture on the wall is actually a futuristic thing. So a lot of meaning in this one, it was trying to reach back and give the city a piece of its history that we've lost. Everything about it was designed to come back to a 1920s, 1930s piece of architecture using kind of contemporary materials. I'm most proud of the doors. Probably Bob is not real proud of the doors. Each one of these doors ran about $8,000, um, but they are beautiful. And uh, my office moved into this building, so it's a labor of love for me. And this is my next to last slide. This is a house on Lake Cable. And the owner came to me and said, I wanted a deck. Well, I just can't just do anything simple, John. It's, so I've known this man for a long time, and he loves electric guitars. He has a collection, and they're beautiful pieces of art in themselves. And I asked him, what's your favorite? Because I know nothing about guitars. And it was some kind of Fender or something. I don't know what it was. I got photographs, started studying them. His deck is the guitar. And he almost hates to put furniture in. Usually he puts the tables away so everybody can see the guitar first. But it turned out great, and this is all about meaning and architecture. Again, when he sits out on his deck, it's very important to him, not just the lawn chair he's in, but the deck he's sitting on and its design. Fortunately, we had a carpenter that, honestly, I've never met such a talented young man. Creating this, all these cuts, all these angles, anybody else would have wanted to kill me. But he absolutely loved it and enjoyed it as much as I did. So 
It all lit up. Beautiful piece of architecture. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alex Nicholas Kuhn, Executive Director for the Maslin Museum. Thank you so much for joining us for our series of virtual brown bag lunch programs presented by MCTV. We're grateful for the partnership with MCTV and we look forward to you joining us for resuming in-person programs. The first of which will be Tuesday, October 26th, featuring Greg Fasseri talking about Gridiron Legacy. Thank you so much and for more information, maslinmuseum.org. <laughs>